Welcome to this video on atomic structure and electron configuration. So the first thing we want to do is just to remind ourselves um, what the basic structures and components of an atom are. And so we're going to take a look at this little diagram here. We have the very center. We have our nucleus. Okay. And inside the nucleus, we have protons. So our protons are positively charged. And we have these, what we would call a relative mass. And for protons, they have one AMU. Okay, we also have in the nucleus some neutrons. They don't have any charge, and so, um, they are just some mass here, so 1 AMU. And so both of these are found in that nucleus. And then outside the nucleus, we have our electrons. Okay, they have a negative charge. And really, we say they don't have any mass. That's not entirely true, but their relative mass is so small in comparison to the other two that we kind of ignore it for all intents and purposes. It's such a negligible amount. So we have a lot of different models of the atom and probably the more recent one outside of the quantum model that we still see frequently used is the Bohr model. And so in the Bohr model, the one thing that's really nice about it is that it actually puts all of our electrons into these energy levels. So it, it originally, it's wrong in that electrons do not, so it's wrong because electrons do not orbit, okay, or take a clear path, um, the nucleus. However, the really nice thing about this is that these n equals 1, 2, 3, and 4, these are actually energy levels. And it's nice for looking at overall energy levels, and so it's usable for that. It's also kind of a simplified model um, in comparison with the quantum model. And so this is actually showing amounts of energy between these different, um, these different levels. And so we see between these different energy levels how much energy it takes to go between one and another um, from, from different perspectives in there. The quantum model is actually our current model. And in this model, we say that we have not orbits, but orbitals. Okay. And those are regions of probability where we are most likely to find electrons. Now, Heisenberg uncertainty principle says we can't know the exact location and the exact um, velocity of an electron at any given moment. And the more we know about one, the less we know about the other. We're not usually too concerned with that for what we do, but we do want to know that the S's, so we have the 1S here, we have the 2S, and we have the 3S, and so we have these S orbitals and s orbitals are always spherical so we can write that up here so we have s orbitals is spherical okay we have these p orbitals and i think of them as a figure eight 
some textbooks will call them a, a dumbbell or a barbell. Okay, and so we have here, we have a 2P, and we'll call this 2PY. We have a 2PX, and we have a 2PZ, okay? And so these are our different orbitals or regions where we'd be, be most likely to find those electrons. We also have some other orbitals, our D and our F orbitals. They become a little more complex in their structures. So what's holding our atoms together as far as force of attraction? Well, in the nucleus itself, we have something called the strong nuclear force or the strong force. And so basically, it is where we have um, a strong force or this glue-like substance, they'll call it, that is greater than the repulsion of all of your positive protons. So P plus is my shorthand for protons. In addition, we have electromagnetic forces of attraction between the negative electrons and the positive protons. And so we have this, um, this concept called Coulomb's Law that basically says the stronger the charge and the closer together, the greater the force of attraction when we're looking at electrostatic forces. And this particular uh, force of attraction or, or concept really governs a lot of what we do in chemistry. And so it's something to keep in mind. We don't have to calculate this for the purposes of chemistry, but it's something that we actually use in order to analyze stuff. So keep in mind that the, the greater the electric charge, so if we have greater values of Q, okay, um, and if our distance is less, Maybe that's hard to see there. So if we have greater charge and closer or less distance, we're going to have a greater force overall of attraction. And so that's something to keep in mind as we're evaluating um, how the behavior of atoms and some trends and when we get into bonding that's really a big important governing um, factor. So I like to look at charts that look like this and so we have this electron arrangement um, or the way that our electrons fill into our atoms um, and we can use the periodic table to help us do this. It took me a long time to actually figure out how to do this well. I have a couple other tools I'll show you as well. Um, but I think this is actually the easiest way to do this. So if you notice, all of the S's are over in the left two columns with the exception of the 1S2, which is going to be in the far right hand column that's going to be helium. Everything in the transition metal block is going to be D's. Everything that's in the um, on the right hand side is in the P block and then our F block is down below. And if we look at this, our energy levels are our big numbers. Our sub level, our S, our P, our D and our F are going to be those letters. And then the one versus the two, the superscript is going to be the number of the electron of that particular electron in the sublevel. And so we can use this to identify where different elements would end with our electron configurations and orbital diagrams. So we have some rules for how these things fill into elements. So the off valve principle says that electrons fill in from lowest to highest energy orbitals. And so it's gonna start with the S and then it's gonna go to the P's. And it starts with a one S, then it would go to the two S. Pauli exclusion principle says that we have two electrons per orbital, and if they are both in the same orbital, they have to have opposite spin. And then Hund's rule says that sublevels with multiple orbitals, so the P, the D, and the F orbitals, must fill each orbital with the same spin first, one in each particular 
orbital, and then we start to backfill. And so, for example, if we had something that was a p orbital, okay, so if it was a p orbital, and say in the p's we had um, a p4, we would have an up arrow for the first three, and then we would backfill in a down arrow. And so we want to make sure we fill all up and then go down. So these are a couple of tools that I like to use. I actually learned how to use the one on the left side. And so on the left side one, we're going to start here with the 1s. And it just follows the order. So 1s, and then it's going to go to the 2s, and then to the 2p and the 3s, and so on and so forth. Okay. On the right-hand side, we're actually going to start at the very bottom. And again, it's going to go from the 1s to the 2s to the 2p. The nice thing about this diagram is each one of these little circles is actually one orbital. And we know that two electrons can fit into each orbital, and so sometimes that helps us to estimate what we're going to have for our electron configuration. So let's go ahead and try an electron configuration. You can use any of those tools that you've seen. I'm going to put some of those um, resources, make those available for you as well online. So the first one asks us to draw an orbital diagram. Okay, so I'm going to do that in blue and do an electron configuration. We'll do that in green for aluminum. So I have to look on the periodic table, and aluminum is number 13, so it has 13 electrons, as is. And it's also in the P block. It's underneath boron. And so it's going to be 1, 2, it's going to be in the 3P1 is going to be the position that it ends in. So I can use that, or I can say I have 13 electrons, and I can just start to fill them in. So for my orbital diagram, I'm going to start off with a 1s, okay, then I'm going to have a 2s, and so I have 2 in here, so 1, 2, and aluminum we said is 13 electrons, so 3, 4. Then I'm going to go to the 2p, that's the next one, so we have 3 orbitals in the 2p, so all 3 of these are part of the 2p, so I'm going to go, so we have 4, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, three S, eleven, twelve, and then the three P, I'm gonna draw all three orbitals, even though I'm not gonna fill all of them. And it's in the three P one position. So let me count them again. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13. So I've accounted for all 13 electrons, and we do want to still draw all of those orbitals for the p's. Now, if I do the electron configuration, it's usually a little bit more simplified. So the electron configuration for this, we write 1s, four electrons being in the 1s, and then we write 2 up here representing each one of these arrows or each electron that's in there. And then we have 2s, and there's 2 in there. And then we have 2p, and we have 6 electrons in the p's. 3s, 2, 3p, 1. And so both of those are different ways of representing electrons in aluminum. So number 2 says write the electron configuration for an element isoelectrically the same as argon. Okay, so isoelectrically the same means it's going to have the same number of electrons. Okay, so this means same number of electrons as argon with a 2 plus charge. And so we have to think of, okay, what's going to have a 2 plus charge that, that would look the same as argon? And so calcium is actually a 2 plus charge as an ion, and when it loses its two electrons, it looks like argon. So we're going to go ahead and do the 
electron configuration only in this particular case. Okay, we weren't asked for both. So the electron configuration for that is going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, because calcium is normally in the 4s2 position, but we need to account for 18 electrons. So either if we're looking at argon or for calcium with a 2 plus charge, we have 18 electrons. So we have 2, 4, 10, 12, 18. And so we can double check that way by counting up all of our electrons. Okay, the very last one is we want to write the noble gas or shorthand electron configuration for selenium. And so when we write our noble gas or shorthand electron configuration, um, we are going to write the previous, okay, so we're going to write the previous noble gas. symbol in brackets and then we just complete the electron configuration after that. So if I look on the periodic table selenium is number 34 and the previous noble gas is actually argon. So I'm going to put argon AR okay. The one that comes after selenium is krypton but we have to have the previous one and then we write the electron configuration for everything that comes after argon. So argon is in the third row, so we're going to actually start with the four S's. So we're going to have 4S2. We have 3D10, because we go from the four S's to the three D's. And then we're going to have the 4P. And if I count from where the P's start, one, two, three, four, it's in the fourth position over, so 4P4. So these are just some examples. We will do some more in class. Please ask lots of questions, and I hope this was helpful for you.